want a hand clap of praise this morning. God, we pray this God, we have you. We thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this opportunity to be in our house again, to hear your word, Lord, to be a part of your service. God, to feel your goodness. God, we pray this God, we love you, Lord. And we worship you here today, God. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. God, we pray this and we love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you again for your kindness, your mercy, and your love, Lord. God, we love you, Lord. And we thank you, God. And we thank you, Jesus. Y'all have to bear with me this morning. Feeling a little extra choked up today. Um, today we'll be on lesson 2.4, and that's titled uh, "Beauty from the Broken." And this will be the the final lesson on Joseph. Uh, the big idea is I will surrender my past to God. And allow him to make something beautiful out of my brokenness. Uh, focus verses are Genesis 45, 7 through 8, and Genesis 50 and 20. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt in 50 and 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Uh, lesson text is Genesis 45, 1 through 6. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him. And he cried, because every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians, heard, uh, the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And then Genesis 50, 15 through 21. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of God thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring the passes this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones, and be comforted. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And finally, the truth about God is God knows how to take what is meant for evil and make something out of good. You may be seated. <laughs> So um, the lesson text was like four chapters long, and I, I've been advised to trim down the, the lesson text just a little bit, so I didn't want to keep y'all standing for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so basically, we've learned the past lessons. Pharaoh has his dream, or he has two dreams, and he can't interpret. No one can interpret them. You have the seven sickly cattle devouring the seven large cattle. You have seven sickly ears of corn and seven healthy ears of corn. And after some years... Uh, servant or Pharaoh's servant remembered Joseph and how he had interpreted dreams in prison. And now we know that the, the seven healthy things represent the seven years of plentiful harvest and the seven sickly things represented seven years of famine that would follow him. And after he installs him, or I'm sorry, after he interprets the dream, Pharaoh installs Joseph to be second in command of all of Egypt. And Pharaoh is the only one in the kingdom that does not answer to Joseph. 
And so he goes about stockpiling all the supplies that he can to help the people survive the famine that's to come. Those seven years of famine are where this lesson starts. And, and I'm not sure what kind of stockpiling system they had in Canaan at that time where Jacob and his family were, but it doesn't seem to have lasted them very long. Things get a little bit dire for him. But somehow Jacob learns that there's grain to be had in, in Egypt. Um, and hopefully y'all read the, the lesson text. You read the lesson in your daily devotional so you know all about the story and everything because, like I said, there's six or seven chapters worth of information just for background on this lesson. And Jacob sends his ten eldest sons down into Egypt to secure supplies for his families. Now, today we have the whole story. We, we know all about Joseph. We know about Jacob and all of them. And prior to them going down into Egypt, we know what God has been doing in Joseph's life, all the ups and the downs. But his brothers knew nothing about what was going on in Egypt at that time. They thought he was just gone in slavery. He was gone somewhere else. But God has created a complex plan, and he's teeing it up right here for a reunion with Jacob and his son. Um, and no one in the family really could have seen that coming because they all thought that he was gone, and Jacob thought that he was dead. And as they roll up to Joseph, I picture the Lord sitting there kind of like Hannibal from the eight team, you know, rubbing his hands. I love it when a plan comes together. And that's probably what he's thinking because he's done all this complex stuff and everything is coming together. It took 13 years of ups and downs to get to this moment. God knew the famine was coming. And we know he has the power to send food from heaven. We, we learn about that later on in Exodus. He can send manna down from heaven. But all of this had to happen with Egypt and Joseph in order for God to advance his bigger plan. And Jacob, <coughs> excuse me, not Jacob, Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. It's, it's been a few years. But I'd say it'd be kind of hard to forget the faces of the people that beat you and, and threw you in a pit and sold you right. into slavery. That's not something you're, you're going to forget very easily. Right. But Joseph's appearance had changed. Last time they seen him, he was 17 years old. And now he's in his 30s. He's the second most powerful man of all of Egypt. So chances are he's adorned like a king. He's decked out in gold. As the kids say, he's got the drip. You know, he's got the swag. He's got all that stuff going on. And he's looking like a pharaoh would look. Now here his brothers are now bowing before him. And what a difference 13 years can make. The dreams of Joseph that they once hated, they're now coming true. His brothers have come to bow before him, but he doesn't reveal himself just yet. He goes about testing his brother. He tosses him in prison for three days. Then he accuses him of being spies. And why did he test them so much? It's not given 100%, but a lot of people believe that it's to see if his brothers had a change of heart after all of these years. Then they mention that they have another brother who I don't believe Joseph met yet, and that was Benjamin. And that would be his, his full brother. And Joseph commands them to go and bring Benjamin back unto him. And it's worth noting here the difference uh, of how the brothers felt about Joseph and how they now felt about Benjamin. It seems something really did change in those 13 years they'd been separated. And with Joseph, they were set on murdering him. They were set on, on doing evil unto him. And they eventually settled on selling him for a few pieces of silver. I think we talked about a few lessons ago. It equals somewhere between 200 to 400 dollars in today's money. That's how much they hated their brother. But with Benjamin, they're now concerned for their little brother's well-being. They have no idea who this Egyptian is, who, who's commanded them, and what exactly he wants to do with their little brother. They worry about what might happen to him if they were to bring him back down into Egypt. But to ensure their cooperation, Joseph holds Simeon as a hostage until they return with Benjamin. And Joseph loads him up with grain and supplies and sends him on their way. And when Jacob gets news, he's very reluctant to send Benjamin down into Egypt. In his mind, he's already had one of his sons killed. He don't want to stand to lose another. And now he's being asked to send one down into Egypt, away from home. And who knows what might happen to him there in the hand of this Egyptian. But Egypt is where the grain is. We talked several weeks about self-preservation. Were, people were dying of starvation, and so they had to go get grain. But when the brothers return to Egypt... Joseph greets them just a little bit differently this time. He frees Simeon, and he brings him into Pharaoh's house and throws a feast for him. But he still hasn't revealed his identity. And as they go to leave, Joseph loads him up again, but he gets to Benjamin's bag, and he puts a silver cup in there. And then once they leave, he sends his guard or whoever it was to ride out after him, and he arrests them for stealing. And he has them brought back before him for punishment for stealing. And they say, whoever's in possession of this cup will become Pharaoh's slave. Here again, we see something that is changing in these brothers. Once they were so eagerly willing to sell Joseph into slavery in, in Genesis 37, 26, and 27, 
It says, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Now that they're faced with their baby brother becoming a slave, panic begins to set in. They begin to beg and, and borrow and plead with Joseph. Judah, the one who came up with the idea to sell Joseph into slavery, is now the one begging to be put in to Benjamin's place. And the brothers rent their clothes in grief over Benjamin's punishment. And the book said that some people may consider it cruel, all the mind games that Joseph is playing on his brothers, but he had to be 100% sure that there really was a change in them, that these weren't the same men that threw him into the pit. That it would be an interesting, you know, what-if situation if Joseph hadn't tried to enact vengeance, if these men hadn't changed, if they were willing to give up Benjamin like they'd given him up. What, how different of a story it could have been. But everyone, including Joseph, over these 13 years had changed for the better. And just as they were being uh, tested and tried, now Joseph himself was being tested and tried. And he'd been tested and tried over and over his life. We've heard about that for three lessons so far. And he was even tested as his brothers were before him. He was betrayed by his own brothers and eventually sold to Potiphar's house. Was given complete authority over everything Potiphar had. And the Bible says Potiphar knew not what he had except that the food that he was going to eat. That's how much he trusted Joseph. That's how much authority he placed in Joseph's hand that he gave him complete control over everything. Now Potiphar obviously had some money. He had servants. He was a captain of a guard. You know, he wasn't a, a, a poor old guy. And it had been real easy for Joseph to steal. It had been real easy for Joseph to be dishonest, to fall into a sinful lifestyle where everything could have been given to him, yet it didn't happen. It had been easy for him to fall into adultery with Potiphar's wife. No one would have known. The Bible says there was no men in the house. It was just him and her that day. And he could have easily given away. He could have betrayed Potiphar's trust. But he said, how can I commit such an evil against God. Joseph was really a stand-up guy. He was tossed into prison, but then he was given all authority over the prisoners. He could have abused that power. He could have been turned away from God, and he could have been commiserating with all the other prisoners that were down there. And we face problems much, much smaller than what Joseph does. And our first reaction is to look up and cry and say, God, why me? Why have you put me in this situation? Why, what have I done to deserve this thing? We've seen people walk away from serving God for, for minor, minor things, and they fail the smallest test sometimes and just give up. But not Joseph. He was stuck in prison for so long, and over something he did not do, he was wrongfully convicted of that crime. And not once did we read about him doubting God or complaining or crying unto God. Now he's elevated into power in all of Egypt. His brothers stand there right before him, and Joseph still being tested. It had been real easy to exact revenge upon all of them make them suffer the same fate as he did, an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth type of punishment? Or should he extend mercy to those who didn't deserve it, those who sold him into slavery for a few hundred dollars? But as always, Joseph passed every single test he ever faced with flying colors. Time had changed everyone for the better, and that's something we have to check on ourselves sometimes. Am I better than I was just a few years ago? Every so often, a message a pastor preached pops in my head, and it was over 12, 13, maybe 15 years ago. And it's, time, it was, it's time for the church to go to war. And over those 12 years, have you fought for the kingdom like you're supposed to have been fighting? Or have you become lazy in your fight? There's only two options in, in that. Are you closer to God now more than you were back then? Are you more faithful to God now than you were back then? Uh, are you giving up on things? Have you let things slide in your life? Have you passed each and every test and trial in your life like Joseph did? Or have you faltered? And if he could do it, we should be able to do it because we've got the Holy Ghost. He didn't have that. And so things should be a whole lot easier for us to make it through. First Peter 1 and 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And James 1 and 12 says, 
Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that loved him. Each of us are going to face tests and trials all throughout our lives, but we only receive our reward if we hold fast, if we don't waver on God. You look at people like Joseph, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, each one tested and tried and each one endured until the end. What got them through the test was a very close relationship with God, was a tight walk with God. And if you're hand, walking hand in hand with God, then you don't have to worry about falling. You don't have to worry about tripping. So when you let go, that's when the problems are going to happen. And, and, and a relationship with God will allow you to walk with confidence into alliance and have no fear when you set foot into a fiery furnace. The ups and downs that Joseph faced won't faze you. It'll cause you to show mercy to those who should be expecting vengeance. It'll cause you to act like Christians are supposed to act. And recently I've gained a new respect for the, the three Hebrew boys because uh, the other night and after prime, a breaker had tripped and, and we were going around the school trying to figure out where it was. And we get to the boiler room and we open that door and man, that, hit, that heat hits you right in the face. It, 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 it was rough. After about 30 seconds, I was ready to get out of there. I was just ready to go. And I can't imagine the heat that, that the Hebrews faced that day, that the strong men were killed at how hot that furnace was. But they walked in and out untouched. And the only way to pass a test like that is to be super close with God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is, as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Many temptations, many trials that are, that are common to man that trip up so many people, lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, all types of, of sin and wickedness that, that will trip you up and mess up your walk with God and that will cause you to fall. We're all susceptible to those things. It's a common thing to man. But no matter how hard the temptation that you're going to face, you don't have to fall into that temptation because it says God is faithful. And when we face those tests, he's going to make a way of escape so we can bear that, that burden. And the escape route only comes through him. He is the door. He's the only door that we have today. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Because sin's going to take you further than you ever ever want to go the thought you you would ever want to go we'll talk about david here in a second but i highly doubt if you if you came up to him that day when he was standing over top of goliath and saying you're going to sin you're going to commit adultery and murder and you're tens of thousands of people are going to die because of your sins he's going to say not me i would never do that i'm a servant of the most high but look where sin got david so there's only one way off of that course there's only one way off that that path of sin like i said that's through that door that's through Jesus. And he's the only one that can sustain you, can, can sustain you through everything. Whenever we talk about tests and, and trials or remain close to God, Sister Vernie is just, it's that low-hanging fruit. That's a super easy example to choose from. We all know some of the things she faced, but more than likely I'll probably, probably never know everything that, that, that she had to face in her lifetime. But one thing she always did, and I probably brought this up before, but it's so ingrained in my mind, it's, it, it's part of her testimony in her life, and it happened every testimony service at watch night service. And every year, she'd be one of the first ones to speak. She'd slowly make her way up here. And she always started with the same line year after year. She said, you know, Brother Clark, God has been good to me. He really has. It wasn't, oh, it was the worst year I've ever had. It wasn't, why me, God? Why do I have to endure all those things? You never heard how poorly she felt. You never heard anything like that. You only heard about the goodness of God in her life. <laughs> And I bet if you were to hand someone a list of everything that she did have to endure through her life, they'd ask how she did it. And it's very simple. She just held on to God until it was all over. Through health, through family, through losing several loved ones, she just kept holding on to God. And her life's an example. And the Bible's littered with, with tons of that. The, when the trials feel like it's too much, all you have to do is just keep holding on to God, and he's going to see you through. <laughs> We sing that song, I know the Lord will make a way somehow, but do you, do you really know that? Do you truly believe that? Because I do. Amen. You know, because 
you can go through a lot of stuff sometimes and you get yourself in, in the big mess and there's only one person that can get you out. Your friends, your family, mom and dad, grandparents, nobody can help you. But Jesus is the only one that can help you get through that. <clears throat> I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't, we talked about that believing and not understanding lesson. I don't know, I understand it all. I don't know the, in, uh, you know, eccentricities and all that stuff. But if I just remain faithful and I hold on to them, just trust his plan, he's going to see me through. He'll make him a way of escape because the Bible says he's a faithful God. That means he, 100% of the time he's going to be there for his children. Like I said earlier, when you let go of God, that's when you're going to have your problems. That's when you're going to stumble. That's when you're going to fall. David was a man after God's own heart, but he wasn't perfect, just like we're all not perfect. He had many troubles in his life, and, and many of them stemmed from one event, and that wasn't Bathsheba. That came after the event that set him on the course for sin. And the Bible says it was time of the year that the kings went to battle, but David tarried in Jerusalem. And we learn what David's original mistake was from Uriah in 2 Samuel 11 and 11. And this is where David is, it's later on, he's trying to cover up his adultery and get Uriah to go into his own house. It says, And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and thy servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. David sent the ark away while he stayed in Jerusalem, a representation of the presence of God here on the earth, and David sent it away from where he was. David's first mistake was separating himself from the presence of God. And because he had separated himself from the presence of God, that opened the door for lust to sneak in there. And then that led to adultery, that led to murder, that led to everything that happened afterwards. Had he been with the ark, had he been where he was supposed to be, Bathsheba would have never have been an issue. Nathan wouldn't have had to prophesy against all his house. The ordeals with Amnon and Tamar and Absalom may not have happened to David because part of the punishment, he said, your children are going to trouble you. You're going to have problems out of your children after God had passed judgment on them. The tens of thousands of people that died because of David's sins and, and the civil war and everything that happened, all because of his mistakes, they might have lived uh, long and healthy lives. And when you're seriously close to God, it's hard for temptations to be effective. When David brought the ark back, he brought it back the second time the right way, he was dancing down the streets, he was praising God, he was offering sacrifice, he was doing everything that he was supposed to do. He abased himself in front of the people and he abased himself in front of God. And not even his own wife mocking him that day could bring him down. But when he separated himself from the ark, that's when the trouble came. Amen. And I don't have time to go deep into all the story of David and everything, y'all can go read it. But after David goes, and this is after the child dies and he gets up and he washes himself because he'd been in mourning. He gets up and he joins his troops where he's supposed to be. He goes and joins the siege and he goes and he's where the ark is. And if you read, it's not long after that, he starts doing the job, the job that God anointed him to do again. And that's when God offered him the peace offering of Samuel. That's when God gave him, or Solomon, sorry, and let him know that everything was okay. When he started doing the job that he was anointed. To do. So if you think you can make it out there without God, good luck. David learned the hard way, and his sin led him down a path that took the lives of three of his children. It cost Amnon, it cost Absalom, and it cost the child that he had with Bathsheba. Learn from his example. Don't learn from experience. Amen. Now Joseph faces his tests of how to treat his brothers, and then he reveals his identity to them. And just imagine the fear that came over each of them. The, they were in disbelief. How is, what are the odds that we're going to stand before our brother that we sold into slavery this day? Now the tables have turned, and he holds their lives in his hands. In the flesh, we think that Joseph had every right to exact punishment upon his brothers for what they did. But Joseph, like we talked about, is cut from a different cloth. In Genesis 45, 4 through 5, it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Basically saying, all is forgiven. Don't beat yourself over that. If, if he didn't have God in his life, it would have been easy for him. He, he could have chopped their heads off right there. He had the power. He had all authority in Egypt to do it. But instead of looking down here on earth and, and the small things, he had the big picture. He had the big view. He saw that God had a plan for his life. <laughs> You know, it's like, you, you sold me into slavery. 
But God brought me before you that day to preserve life. You sought to kill me, but God took what you were working for evil and he ended up working it for my good so that he could save his people and he could preserve his children. And then he tells them, bring Jacob unto me, bring my father unto me. And Jacob was in disbelief when he heard this news because for 13 years he thought his son was dead. He didn't know what was going on down in Egypt. But when he seen the, the wagons and he seen all, everything that was brought back, he had to have known that Joseph was still alive. And the Bible says that when the Joseph saw them, that he fell upon their necks and he was weeping when they were reunited. There was much crying that was had that day. Joseph trusted the plan that God has for his life. And God has a plan for each and every one of our lives today. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them which are called according to his purpose. If you're part of the plan, things are going to work out for your good if you're a servant of God. Last week upstairs, we were talking about Joseph as well. And I was telling the kids how, how God can take bad things that happen in your life and turn them around and, and, and work things for good. And in February and March uh, 2018, it was a fun time in our family because I'd had my first surgery. Dad broke his leg. The pastor had just retired because I believe it was a catheterization he had. So we were all kind of laid up for a little bit. Poor Dwayne had, that was the year we had tons and tons of snow. And poor Dwayne had like seven yards to take care of. We love you, Brother Dwayne. <laughs> And so dad was in the cast and I couldn't drive, but the pastor could. So he was our chauffeur just for a little bit and things worked out for us. And I kept having more issues, kept being out of work and I was on disability. And it wasn't that fun because you only make 60% of your income and then the company doesn't pay their share of the insurance. So you have to pay that out of your pocket. So needless to say, I was ready to get back. You know, I know I joke around about getting out of work and everything, but I really was anxious to get back. But HR kept telling me no. I'd ask, what papers do you need? And I said, tell me letter for letter what you need them to say. They'd say, okay. They'd send me the emails. I'd email the doctor. A week later, I'd get the paperwork. I'd send it in HR. They'd reject it. Never gave me a reason why. They said, you can't come back yet. I'm like, okay. A few weeks would go by. Rinse and repeat. And I did it many, many times. But October rolls around. I believe it was October. And dad ends up in Wake Forest for 10 days. I'm still off work. So I was able to be there for that. I was able to drive mom back and forth to the hospital and help where I needed to. And then I needed another surgery in December. And had they let me back at work before this happened, I would have had to have gone off again and started the whole disability process. I'd had to go without pay for, I think it was either 30 or 60 days. I'd missed, you know, that, that much pay. But during that time, I also decided to change my major to, to IT work. And now that's led to a job that I love. And that's opened other doors in my life. And if you'd ever been up to Pats and seen me play basketball, you'd probably say, there's no way this guy's ever going to coach a basketball team. But here I am today. I get to work with kids that don't have the best home lives, very, very sad stories. But now I can be a positive influence on them. If I'd stayed at my other job, I would never met these kids. I would never had a chance to influence them. And I give God all the glory for everything. But I've had teachers come up to me and ask, they say, what are you doing exactly? What have you done different? to help these kids. They said, because once they've started playing basketball, we've seen their grades going up. We've seen certain behaviors go away. Whenever they're around you, they're all pretty much on their best behavior. Now, when they get back in the classrooms with the teacher, they falter back a little bit, but they're improving. They're still steadily improving. And God took something terrible that happened over four years ago, and now he's working it for my good, and he still continued to work it for my good. And not only for my good, but for all the people that are around me. I don't always understand the plan. I don't always understand all the, the fine details that God has, but I know he's working things for my good. And like the lesson title, it says he can make beauty from the broken things. In Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He took Joseph from Jacob's favorite son to the pit and then the Potiphar's to prison. And now it's taken him to being over all of Egypt, almost basically like a king. Through all of these trials, he was teaching Joseph a few different things. And I may not always understand the plan, but I'm going to trust the man that wrote the plan. And I, I'm skipping around a little bit on the timeline of events here. But right after Jacob died, we read it in the, in the, the, the lesson text. And, and right after he died, his son's, 
present themselves to Jacob. But before they go, they send a, a messenger to deliver a message. And, and it's now it's, he's dead. They're scared for their lives. They said, surely Joseph will hate us. He's going to repay us for all the evil that we did to him this day. He's going to wait. Now that dad's dead, now comes time for the revenge. And they present themselves to Joseph again. And again, remind him of that message from Jacob, that he forgive his brothers and do them no harm. But as Joseph's hearing these words, he begins to cry. And I think it's probably a sad cry. Yeah. That, that's my opinion of it. He said, I think probably thinking, I've been so good to them. And here they are still worried about their lives in my hands. In Genesis 50, 19 through 21. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am I in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. He says, I'm not in the place of God. God's the one that has to judge. But we're all good now. I've forgiven everything is okay. What you've meant for evil against me, God has taken it, working it for my good. You sought to kill me, but God is working good that I might save many lives. God worked it to where Jacob could not only, or Joseph, I'm sorry, that he was saved himself, but that he could end up saving his whole family. When Joseph sent for Jacob, he sent wagons, he sent supplies, he said, here's everything you need to bring all your little ones, your women. Everyone in the family can come down to Egypt where we have things. And I think it was around 70 people in total that came down with Jacob out of Canaan. And then as they leave, he gave them a bag of 300 pieces of silver, 15 times the amount of what he was sold into slavery for. He was continuing to do good unto them. And I think I've said it before, but the blessings of God are just like an infomercial. You hear one thing, but it's like, wait, there's more, and there's more, and there's more, and there's more. <laughs> Excuse me. The famine hit Egypt. The people needed supplies. And Joseph looks at them. He says, sell me your flocks. They say, okay, we need bread, we need money, we need everything. They said, the flocks are now yours. And so Pharaoh takes control of pretty much all the flocks that are in Egypt. Next year, the same exact thing happens. All the people had now was their land. And they sold it to Pharaoh as well. So now all the land belonged to Pharaoh. And this is all going on in the background. This is, he's dealing with Jacob and, and, and his brothers. Um, and so Joseph begins to talk to Pharaoh. And he says, let Jacob and your family live in Goshen. God took Jacob's family out of the land of Canaan into the best land in Egypt. In Genesis 47, 5 through 6, it says, And Pharaoh spoke unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee, and the best land make thy father and thy brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. He's saying, I'm giving you the best land in Egypt. You know, it turned out this is where Israel was going to stay for 400 years, the best land in all of Egypt. And not only that, Joseph, if you have any men of experience, of any man of activity, any people that know how to deal with cattle in your family, go ahead and make them rulers over the cattle, over my cattle. Now, this just wasn't a small group. This was all the cattle in Egypt. And Pharaoh's saying, Joseph, you've been so good to me. Just go ahead and, and, and continue to bless your family as well. The goodness of God was on Joseph, and now it was being spread out upon his family members, and they were being exalted in Egypt as well. <clears throat> But wait, there's more. Genesis 45 and 28. And Israel said, It is enough, Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. My son, who I thought was dead, is now alive. And Jacob said, That's enough for me. And in chapter 48, Jacob and Joseph are together. And Jacob passes on a blessing to him before he dies. But then Joseph calls in his two sons. And Jacob looks at him, he's getting old in age, and he looks at him, he says, who are these two men? And Joseph says, these are my sons, these are your grandchildren. And we get to Genesis 48 and 11. And Israel said unto Joseph, 
I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also. And I said, he went from thinking, my son is dead, now he's alive, that's enough for me just to see Joseph before I die. I never thought I'd see you, but now God has allowed me to see you. And not only has allowed me to see you, he's allowed me to see my grandchildren as well. You talk about an example of the goodness of God, that's the goodness of God. I'll go ahead and admit this now. I've done a little grumbling, you know, that we've had four lessons in a series. I've had to teach all four, two down here, two upstairs, all on, on Joseph. You know, I was like, you know, enough's enough. Just break it down into two. But after studying this one, I'm glad they did stretch it out for, for a four-part series. Because each time you go through a lesson, each little bit that was broken down, and, it, and you get down to the, the minute details in Joseph's life, you continue to see the goodness of God working in different, all the little cracks and crevices in that story. And then in the big picture thing, you see all the goodness of God working. Each time someone sought evil against him, God turned it around and made it for his good. His brother sold him, and God exalted him to Potiphar's. Potiphar's wife lied, and he was put into prison, and God exalted him in prison. And then from prison, God exalted him over all of Egypt to save countless lives and to set the stage for the Israelites to come, that they would have a place to grow and a place to multiply, and then one day be delivered into the promised land. Now we know the devil is our adversary. He's walking about like a, a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And they sought to stifle the church as well. You know, the enemy sought to, 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 to quiet the church, to silence it. People like Paul wreaked havoc upon the church. The Bible says and there was great persecution but what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it around and worked it for their good. If y'all have ever seen a, a movie or an old western, and you see a fire break out, you see people get them big old blankets and they start swatting at it. You know, a barn with hay or, or full of cotton. And, you know, they just go around and they just start smacking that thing. That's how they're going to put the fire out. Well, if you think about it, that's really one of the dumbest ways that you can fight a fire. Because every time you hit that fire, you're sending ambers up in the air. And you're causing it to spread more and more and more. And they thought they could silence the church back then. They thought they could beat the church into submission. But every time they took a swing, it kept sending embers further and further and further away. Where it was once centralized in Jerusalem, now it spread out to Antioch and all these different places, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. All because the enemy said, we're going to shut down the church. But God said, you think what you're doing is going to shut down the church, but it's actually uh, working for my plan to enable the church to spread. They thought they could get rid of it and they just quash it real quick. But what they didn't realize is that every time they was doing that, another soul was getting saved. Thousands and thousands of souls were saved, all because of the enemy coming against the church and God taking their evil and working it for good. The big idea was I will surrender my past to God and allow him to make something beautiful out of my brokenness. Now, again, none of us are here are perfect. None of us are, are without sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And some of you may have done more than me. Some of you may have done more than others. Some of you may have been limited to the cross most of your life. I don't know. But God can still take any of the broken pieces in your life and put you back together and make something beautiful. The potter can reform the clay into usable, uh, to something that's usable for his purpose. And then when he puts you back together, you can be an example to people of how good God is and how he can take what the enemy's meant for evil and turn it around for good. I, I know I've told the story before, but... It's one of those that, that fits really good in with the lesson. It's the, and I, I forgot to write his name down. But it was the man that was on death row down in, in Johnson City. Um, he was an evil, evil man, was on drugs. He went and he killed his grandmother. He didn't kill her. I mean, he, he butchered her. And he disposed of the body and went to the family Christmas party that night. It was, he was just crazy. There was nothing but pure evil on the inside. And he got thrown in the jail. He eventually got caught, and they, they gave him the death sentence. And so he, he's doing his thing. He's just living in prison. But someday, or one day, someone gets a notion to send him a tape of Brother Davis preaching. And he puts that tape in and he listens and something hits him. Something powerful hits him. Brother Davis gets a phone call and it's from the warden and they connect him. And it's the man, he says, Brother, I want that power 
of what you preached about. I, you kept talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. He said, I want that power that you're preaching about. So they did Bible studies and everything. And they went in on death row with the hardest of the hardest inmates and baptized him in Jesus' name. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> There's more. So he was completely changed. Then he began to witness and teach to other prisoners there on death row. And they went in and they baptized even more people on death row. The worst of the worst criminals, we would say, down in Jesus' name. What the enemy meant for evil. The, if you looked at that guy's life, you would have said, he's got his ticket punched straight to hell. He's on that long black train and he ain't going until he gets to that final destination. But one day, that door opened up and he got off that track and he went from going down to hell to where he was saved and he ended up making it into hell. And not only that, there's more to it. Where he went from taking people's lives, they sought to, to cancel or give him a, I forget the, the commute of sentence or whatever it is, basically where he didn't die, that he just spent the rest of his life in prison to, to try to get the governor to change it, but the governor wouldn't change his mind. That even the corrections officers began to testify about how good of a person he was and how if there was anyone that was ever, you know, uh, rehabilitating the, the prison system, it was this man. He went from taking lives to then there was a prison riot and people were getting stabbed that he ended up saving guards' lives. There was a man who was disabled. They had no wheelchairs in the prison. You can imagine the, the type of conditions they were in. And he would pick him up every day and carry him on his shoulders through the prison, through the worst of the worst criminals, and would bathe him and then would carry him back into his prison cell. You want to talk about the power and the goodness of God? If God can change someone like that, he can definitely move in your life, your kids' life, your family's life. He can move in anybody's life. But he's gone now. He was, he was executed by the state. But that still doesn't mean that his story's over. He's an example that we can all look to, that you can tell people, that you can share an example of. Because we have Paul and everything, and, and we have these examples of people who, who are gone there. Thousands of years have gone now. But now we have examples of people that are still happening, that God is still working, that God is still moving on people, even in the modern times that we can point to and show examples of. And now we all need to get our acts together. We all need to, to get close to make ourselves right with God. And begin to reach out to all the sinners, to all the lost people that are in this world. We need the rough ones to come in. We need the drug addicts to come in so that we can say, when God cleans them up, why don't you look at what the Lord has done? If he can do this for them, then he can definitely do this for you. He can do it for all of us. And again, none of us are perfect, but the altar is open today. For God, all you have to do is say, here's the broken pieces of my life. I just need you to glue me back together again because I can't do it. There's a reason the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. When it talks about, we read in that scripture earlier in 1 Corinthians 10, it was, it says you're going to face troubles, you're going to face temptations, there's going to be a lot of weight to bear. But God is faithful and he's always going to have that door open for you. So if you're walking close with God, he's going to provide that escape route for you. And so you may not be walking on the straight and narrow today, you may not be living at the foot of the cross, but if you come to the altar, you can make things right. You don't have to leave like you came into this building. Joseph's brothers saw him coming and they said, behold, this dreamer cometh. They were mocking him. And little did they know that they'd be setting the stage for those, setting the stage for those dreams that they hated so much, those dreams that they mocked for, how they mocked this teenager by saying one day that you're going to bow down to me. Little did they know that they were helped setting the stage, that they were helped bringing these dreams to completion. God has a plan for your life. May not always be the smoothest ride, may not always be the most fun ride. Like I use myself as an example, I didn't foresee all my stuff happening to me when I turned 28. I didn't foresee a lot of things happening, but that's just the way it goes. And that's God's plan that he has in my life. I've mentioned it many, many times here. I honestly never believe I'd be behind the pulpit because I hate public speaking. I still do come to choir practice. It's tough, Pastor, it's tough to get me to pray, to open up to pray in, in choir practice. It's just because there's something inside of me that doesn't like public speaking. But when I get up here, I can't shut up. I just, I don't, it's, it's a God thing, okay? But I, not, I never honestly saw myself, I thought, I'll just play the bass. I'll just be in the background. I'll do my own thing. But thanks to COVID, you know, we was up here every 
once in a while, you know, once every year or whenever, filling in for Dwayne when he traveled. COVID kind of accelerated things, and now we're up here on a weekly basis. But that just goes to show that you can plan your life. And the old saying is, you want to make God laugh, tell him what plan you have for your life. And God has a plan for you. I know he's got a plan for me. And if he can bring me from where I was, where I couldn't even testify, y'all remember how bad I was at men's prayer service, to where I could get up here and talk for 45 and 50 minutes straight. If he can do that for me, I know he can do anything for you. And so like I said, it's not always the smoothest thing. It's not always the easiest ride. But as long as you're walking hand in hand with God, he'll take whatever's thrown at you and work it for your good as long as you're one of his servants. Pastor. I've got a, it's not a new song, <laughs> it's an old song, but I want to do it this morning. It's page 18 in the songbook, it's called Near the Cross, and um, I, I wanted to know a little bit of history on this one. I, when I was looking and thinking of songs to do today, and, and I really do want to pick the right ones all the time for service, and um, so this one just came to mind. And it was written back in 1869 by a woman named Franny Crosby. And she was blind from six weeks of age on, was never able to see. But she wrote over 8,500 uh, 8, hymns. She just loved the Lord. And she worked at a school for the blind. Anyway, in her older years, someone came to her and asked if she could have any wish in the world that she wanted, what would it be? And, of course, they're thinking in, in their mind she's going to, Think, you know, I wish that I had my sight. But she said, I want to continue to be blind. I said, why in the world is that? She said, because the first face I want to see is Jesus. I want to see his face first when I get to heaven. So keep me near the cross. If you don't know this song, it's really easy. You'll be able to learn it really, really quick. See? Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flow. From Calvary's mountain in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever.
94 in your songbook. If we stay near the cross, we'll make it to heaven and everybody's going to be happy over there. There's a happy land of promise over in the grave beyond where the Savior birth shall soon the glory share and where the souls of men shall enter and be born Evermore, everybody, everybody will be, be happy over there. Oh, I know everybody will be happy, yes, will be happy over there. Oh, yes, we will shout and sing his praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, we will hear nobody pray and no mourning in that land. For no burdens there will be for us to bear. All the people will be singing glory, glory to the Lamb. Everybody will be happy over there. I know everybody will be happy. We'll be happy over there. We will shout and sing and praise. Everybody will be happy over there. And know everybody will be happy. We'll be happy over there. We will shout and Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, I know everybody will be happy. Will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody. We'll be happy, we'll be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. Shout and sing his praise. Everybody will be happy over there. I feel the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me. I feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. I feel the joy of the Holy Ghost all over me. I feel the joy of the Lord falling 
fresh on me. I feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. I feel the joy of the Holy Ghost all over me.
exalted high in the train of his robe it filled the temple and the angels gathered round him and they
how holy he is, Lord Jesus, God. Let's let him know that we know how holy he is this morning, Lord Jesus. God, we know that you're holy today, Lord Jesus, God. Lord, we praise you, Lord Jesus, God. We honor you, Lord Jesus. Because you are holy. Lord, you are a holy God this morning. I, as I was singing, I just couldn't help but think about, as Jonathan was talking about the story about that man that was on the death, death row. And he killed his grandmother, butchered his grandmother. And in my mind, I can't understand how God can forgive. In my mind, you would want to hold something against him. Even think about his brothers or his family and those that would look at him. Think about that. But I thank God because he's holy. That's why I can't understand it, Brother Clarence. I, I can't comprehend the mercies and the grace of God, but I appreciate God. Because the same mercy and grace that forgave him is the same grace and mercy that forgave me this morning, God. And I appreciate you, God, because of your holiness and because of your forgiveness and because of your mercy, God, and because of your grace, Lord Jesus, God. I appreciate you, Lord. God, I appreciate you that your ways are far far above my ways, God. I appreciate you, Lord, because your ways, Lord, are so much higher than my ways, and I can't understand your ways, but God, I appreciate the love and the mercy. I can't understand sometimes why you forgive me, Lord Jesus, God, for my slackness and my... Oh, Lord Jesus, God, I appreciate you, though, Lord. God, you are so holy this morning, Lord. God, you are so holy this morning, Lord. I appreciate you, Lord. God, I love you, Lord Jesus. God, I praise you this morning, Lord. understand what's going on we don't always comprehend the, the things that God has going on I you just, I look at Ukraine and I get mad and I get upset and and I say God where are you at and but there's a plan there's the things that are in process that I don't quite understand I, I appreciate the, um, the pastor uh, sent the, from the church uh, $2,000 to a minister there in Kiev. I think that's how you say the word of that, and I appreciate that, that so much. You may not feel like you're having a difference, but we're making a difference around the world, even in the people in U Ukraine, the things that we do from this church, that we are helping others across the world, and I appreciate God so much for that. If you have your Bibles, if you would, if you would turn to Jeremiah chapter 38, uh, and we'll read verses 14 through 20, which is a lot for me normally, but I think I needed these. And we'll talk about them some while we're in the message. And then Jeremiah 38, 14 and 20, and then Romans 5 and 19. And uh, I'm kind of picking up off where the pastor had left off a little bit last week. He dabbled in this one while he was talking about it. And I was thinking I'd already had my thoughts and the scriptures and things that I was going to be preaching on this week. And I was like, thinking maybe he was going to get into mine, but he didn't, and I appreciate it. Jeremiah, and I just appreciate God, that's just the way he works. Jeremiah 38, verses 14 through 20. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? 
And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth into the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire. And thou shalt live and thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hands of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah said, Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, Thou shalt they shall not deliver thee, obey. Obey, I beseech thee the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. Obey, and thy soul shall live. And then Romans 5 and 19, For as by one man's obedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And I just want to preach, speak to you on this, this thought this morning, committed to obedience. Committed to obedience. Pastor, if you would pray, please. Jesus, God, we thank you, Jesus, for your mercies. God, we thank you for the word of God, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the anointing that comes with the word, with the truth, Lord Jesus. God, I ask you this morning, Lord, to move on my heart, God, to move on my mind, to move on my lips, to move on my thoughts. God, I appreciate you as a holy God. Lord Jesus, God, you are holy, Lord Jesus. God, speak into my heart. Let the words be from you. Let it be from your heart, not my heart. Your mind, not my mind, Lord Jesus. God, let it be from you, Lord Jesus. God, we appreciate you, Lord. Speaking to me this, speaking to this church, Lord. God, we give you praise and glory, Lord. You, yay, and amen, Lord. Jesus. Give, give the Lord. Let's give the Lord another clap off and a praise this morning, Lord. may be seated. I can't overestimate, I can't overemphasize the importance of praise and worship. I cannot overemphasize the power that lies in praise and worship. If you get your mind on God and praise Him and worship Him, it will make a difference in your life. Chapter 37 of Jeremiah starts with Nebuchadnezzar moving Jehoiakim, which the pastor was preaching about last week, from being king. And instead of his son sitting on the throne, he brings in Zedekiah to be the king. And it says that the people would not listen to the words of the Lord. They wouldn't heed the commandments and the preaching of Jeremiah and all the other prophets. But it said that Zedekiah asked Jeremiah to pray for the Lord to the Lord for the people. He asked Jeremiah, even though he wasn't a right walking king, he still approached the prophet Jeremiah and asked for him to pray for the people. He wanted Jeremiah to pray for the, the people, pray for their situation, to pray. They were in captivity and he wanted God to bring them. He's, he's the leader of the people now and he wanted direction. He wanted people to serve the Lord. I believe he really wanted people to turn their hearts to the Lord. I believe they really wanted God to help him in that situation. But the problem was that they wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't obey God. They wouldn't heed the words of God. And and the more that they preached to them, the worse that it got. He wanted God to move for them, but they still only wanted Burger King God. They wanted it their way. They wanted God the way that they wanted. And so Nebuchadnezzar's army ends up leaving and going to fight the Egyptians uh, who were causing some stir. And so it gives Judah and Israel this, this hope 
that they were going to be freed, that Nebuchadnezzar was going to leave them and wasn't going to come back to them. And Jeremiah told them, so no, guys, that's not what's going to happen. God has done pronounced his judgment. It's going to happen. You might as well get prepared for it. You may, might as well get re uh, ready for it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah looked at him. He said, if there was nothing left of, of Nebuchadnezzar's army except a bunch of wounded men, they would still rise up and defeat you. And the city is going to be better. It, but he said, the thing is, but God, you've got to obey God. You've got to go with the Babylonians. That was the message that Jeremiah was preaching to them was to turn. It's, it's God's punishment. It's inevitable. God's word has already spoken it. He has held it back and held back his wrath for so long. And now it's coming to pass. And there's nothing we've, we can't do anything about. We've, put, we've, we've passed that point of no return. And God is going to pour out his wrath on the people of Israel. All we can do is let, you know, all we can do is allow ourselves to fall into his hand rather than his hand falling on top of us. I'd rather fall on the rock. I don't want the rock falling on me. So the princes of, uh, the princes of, uh, the princes of it, Judah and stuff begin to accuse Jeremiah of being in league with the Chaldeans, and they throw him in pri prison, but the king secretly goes to Jeremiah and asks, is there a word of the Lord? He was still coming to Jeremiah in secret. He didn't want people to see what he was doing. He said, is there a word of the Lord? And again, he wants to do what's, what's right, but he's afraid of the people. He's afraid of what they think of him. He's afraid of what they're going to say. And, you know, we can't base our relationship with God with, on, with concern about what people think of us. I can't worry about what you think about me and the way I'm serving God. I can't worry about what my wife thinks about me and the way I serve God. I can't worry about my, my, my kids or my grandkids or, or my boss or my friends and the people away i got to base it on what God can do for me. I've got to base my relationship with God on what God can do for me. And he's the only one that can save my soul. He's the, Brother Jonathan said he's the only way of escape I've got in this world. He's the only way out that I know of. I don't know of any other way out of this place and into heaven except through God, through Jesus. So I have to base my relationship not on fear of what they think, but on fear of what he thinks. On the fear of what God says. He's the only one that can save us. And so Jeremiah says, yes, there is a word from the Lord. And it's the same word that I've been given to you from time and time. You're going to be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. You might as well accept it. Again, this is God's punishment. Fall into the hands of God. Don't let the hand of God fall on top of you. And so Jeremiah looked at him and asked. He said, I've got another question that I want to ask of you. He said, why did you allow them to put me here? He said, where are all your prophets? Where are all the prophets that were coming to you and telling you that the Babylonians wouldn't come, coming, and all this punishment wasn't coming? And when I was preaching to you, telling you it was coming, and you had all these other guys telling you, no, it's not going to come. We're going to, we're going to defeat the Babylonians. Where are they at now? Where are all those false prophets at? Where are all those people that bring out all these false prophets? Uh, there's, uh, there's, those false prophets, you know what they do? They turn tail and they run. They take off. They take off so they can disappear. We've seen them disappear. We've seen them disappear here lately. They've just gone into hiding, and they don't want anybody to see them. He said, where are they at? He said, you're listening to these false prophets, and when their message doesn't happen, then they just turn tail and run. And here you are, king, left all by yourself. He said, and he asked him, he said, I want to be left in the prison. Jeremiah wanted to be left in the prison because he didn't want the kings to be able to allow him. And the king abides, told him, he said, I'm going to leave you in the prison. But he told him, he said, I'm going to bring you some food every day. I'm going to have bread delivered to you until there's no bread left in Jerusalem. Now think about that statement because the king knew what was getting ready to happen. He said, I'm going to bring you bread until there's no bread left. He knew there was coming a day when there was not going to be any bread. He knew that we know that there's coming a day when calamity's coming. We, it's already started. We already know that it's going to happen. We, we know we can't wait until it happens before we make some changes in our life. I, I'm going to bring you bread until that. I want to be ready for it. We know it's coming. We've heard the preaching. I'll be the first one to tell you that I never thought I'd grow up and be married and have kids. I thought the Lord was coming. But the Lord's still coming, Pastor. I still know He's coming. I don't know if He'll be coming for the church or if I'll get out of this world and pass away myself before it happens. But I know He's coming, so i, I got to be ready for it. 
He has to be left in there. So the princes come to the king and they ask him, say, we want to put Jeremiah to death. We want to put him to death because he's told the people we want you to give up to the invaders. He's given in. He's given up to the enemies. And so Jeremiah 38 and 5, the king says, he's in your hands. He tells the princes, he's the king. And he tells the princes, he's in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Now, that's like me telling the pastor, I want to do this. And the pastor said, you go ahead, Dwayne. I can't do nothing against you. I would think if I tried to do something outside of the pastor's will or something that he wanted, I believe there would be something that he would do that would be against Dwayne. He might, me, he might knock me upside the head just because I'm a nephew and he, might, he can get away with that. But he was the king, and here he is. He's so afraid of people. He's so afraid of what people is going to say and what people are going to think about him that he's telling them, guys, he's, he's in your hands. You can do with him. With, you know, here he is. He's believing. He's going to Jeremiah. You know, what's the, what's the Lord saying? Give us a word. Pray for us. He believes in God. He knows who God is, and he's going to allow them to have their way with the man of God because he's afraid of what they're going to say, he, what he's, he's afraid of, of what they're going to do. So they take Jeremiah, and you know the story. I hope you know the story. They lower him down into the, he's in the middle of the prison, and they go down into the basement of the prison, and they, mower him, they lower him down into this muck and this mud, and he, 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 he sinks up into this mud, and who knows how deep it is, uh, how deep it is, and so they're going to leave him there to die. They're just basically putting him there for him to starve to death. They wasn't planning on bringing him no bread. They wasn't pl pl planning on doing anything for him. They were going to leave him in the middle of this muck and mud and just let him starve. But there was an Ethiopian eunuch, somebody that uh, Adrian's probably related to somewhere down the road. There's an Ethiopian eunuch that interceded for him. God had sent somebody to intercede for Jeremiah, and he goes and tells the king, he said, somebody stood up for what was right. Somebody went up to the king and said, you're going to allow these evil men to do something so it's like sister Sharon standing up for what's right for this little child somebody's got to stand up for kids somebody's got to stand up for these kids and make a difference in their lives for these things I, I, somebody's got to stand up for truth and what the right thing to do Sharon's story reminded me yesterday I was, uh, I was over at the mall, I was over at Chick-fil-A, and, and I seen a friend that I used to work with, and he has a grandson with him, and he's eight years old, and I'm talking to him about some things we used to do in the past, and, and then his grandson just looks at me, who's your favorite serial killer? I'm going, what? <laughs> and his, his, his granddad kind of got embarrassed, and I would say, I guess so, I guess, you know, the, the little kid's asking, and he's telling me about these games that he plays, and I'm like, why are you allowing this junk the, you know, who's your, I said, I'm my favorite serial killer because I can kill a box of Frosted Flakes quicker than you can shake your head. <laughs> because that's what comes into my mind. But the things that, I, I don't know, uh, the things that Sharon, the teachers, the, th kid, the, the kids today, there's somebody has got to stand up for truth. There's some, somebody has got to stand up and tell these people, get this junk out of your house, folks. Don't be allowing this junk in there. But the Ethiopian gets up and tells him, said, why are you allowing Jeremiah to die like this? So the king says, take 30 men. He said, I want you to take 30 men, and I want you to go get him out. And so here was the king. He was a flip-flopper. You know, he wore flip-flops. All he was doing was walking around flip-flopping. Whoever happened to be in his ears, that's who he was going towards that day. He was a double-minded man. And we know what James said in James 1, through 6, uh, 1, 6 through 8. He said that a man that wavers is like a, a, a wave that's in the sea that's driven by the wind. He said, he said don't let this man think he's going to get anything from the Lord. A man that's one way one day and another way the next day, don't let him think he's ever going to get in. That's a strong statement to think that one day I'm serving the Lord and the next day I'm not serving the Lord. He said, don't let that man think at any time in his life he's ever going to get anything from the, guy, from the Lord. He said, because a, a double-minded a double man is unstable in all of his life. And God can't trust him. God can't trust a flip-flopper because one day you tell him one thing, you, one day you'll tell God, yeah, God, I'm going to serve you, God, I'm going to worship you, and the next minute you're out there doing whatever it is. You want God your way. You want, the way, you want God the way that you want him. He was unstable, and he wasn't committed to simply obeying God. He wanted to please the king. Want, the king wanted to please, his, please the flesh, but he also wanted to please the spirit because I believe in his heart. I think in his heart he wanted to do what's right, but the spirit and the flesh fight they fight against each other the spirit of the lord that's inside of me fights against what my flesh wants to do and the old story about feeding the dog and which one's the strongest the one you feed the most 
is the one that's going to be the strongest. And if I feed my flesh more, my flesh is going to be stronger. But if I feed my spirit more, my spirit, if I start every day out in prayer, if I start every day out in reading, if I start every day out in thinking about God, my spirit will be strong enough to overcome the flesh. But if I don't do those things, my flesh is going to be stronger. So the 30 men come and they save Jeremiah and they pull him out of the muck and, they, the, uh, and the mud. And here's the Lord looking out for the man of God. It, it seemed like he might have lost his life to the enemy, but the Lord pulled him out. Jeremiah was committed to the Lord. He was committed to giving the word of God. He was committed to being a preacher of the, of the gospel of that time, to obeying God, to delivering the message. And even if it meant it was a danger to his life. He didn't care. He said, whatever God tells me, I'm going to do it. I don't care what kind of situation it's in. And because he did that, God protected him. The Lord protected him. And that's what happens when we make the commitment to God. God, even if I fall down, I'm still going to trust you. God, even if I fall down flat on my face, God, I'm still going to trust you. I'm still getting up. If the enemy's throwing me in a pit, God, I'm still going to trust you, God. I'm still going to serve you. Even if it seems like the whole world's crashing in on around me, God, I'm still going to trust you. God, I'm still going to survive, uh, serve you because God provides that way of escape, like Jonathan said. He's the only way of escape I've got. He's the only ticket I got out of this place. I'm going to ride that train. That's the train I want to be on. Not that long black one Jonathan talked about. <laughs> Psalms 9 and 10 says, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. God is not going to forsake us. Those that are committed to, to seeking the Lord, he's not going to forsake us. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to neglect us. He's never going to leave us alone. And that's a comfort in the time of trouble when you know that even when you may be all alone in your bedroom, sitting there crying because it feels like everything's coming against you, I'm still not alone. Even though I may feel like I'm by myself, even though it seems like you're in the depths of despair, the Spirit of the Lord can still speak to you if you are committed to Him. You're not alone in that pit. He is not going to leave you alone down there. He He's going to make a way of escape for you. He's not going to leave you there. Even when you can't see it, he's working. Even though you can't feel it, he's working because he never stops. He never stops working. He is the way maker. You seen that commercial, uh, the head and shoulders commercial with Troy Palomo? Never not working. Never not. That's, that's, that's Jesus. He's never not working in our lives. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't go on vacations. He doesn't take time off. He's always concerned about us. He's never not working in our favor if we're committed to him. Jeremiah's rescued, and the king goes to him again, and he begins to secretly speak to him. And he tells Jeremiah in 38, 14, he says, I want to ask you a question, and, and I don't want you to hide anything from me, Jeremiah. I don't want you to hide anything from me. And Jeremiah tells him in verse 15, he says, if I tell you an answer, if I give you the, the answer to your question, you're not going to like it, and you're probably just going to kill me. He said, you're, you're not going to listen to the counsel that I give you. Maybe, Pastor, that's what we sh you should do when you have people ask you advice, not the part that, that you'll kill me. But, but you say, you know, if I give you counsel, you're just not going to listen to me. You know, why should I give you godly counsel when you've never listened to the counsel I've given to you in the past? We've seen those people that call two and three and four and five and six different people asking their advice for things because they're not really looking for godly wisdom. They're looking for advice that suits their desires. They're listening to, they're wanting to find that person that will tell them the things that they want to hear. Well, Jeremiah wasn't one of them guys. He's not one of those guys that tells people. He wasn't going to tell the king what he wanted to hear. He was going to give him the word of God, whether, whether it hurt or whether it was good for him. Whatever it is, you're just going to get the word of God. And I thank God for the past. Pastor, I thank God for people that stand up in this pulpit. Everybody from Brother Franklin to Brother Kirk to Brother Joey to Jonathan to Thomas to the pastor, uh, Brother Davis, whoever else that stands up here and preaches. And even though it's hard, even though sometimes we need hard things preached to us, it's not all rosy. Sometimes we need our feet stepped on so that God reminds us. I want the truth because the truth is what sets me free. 
That's the thing that makes me free, the truth. I, there, there's so much lying, there's so much untruth in the world today. Watch the news. You, I done got to the point where I don't believe what they show you on TV anymore. There's, and that's everybody. There's a, there was a poll out there. I think there was like 40% of the people doubt really what's going on in, in Ukraine because they don't believe what the, what the media is doing. Even though they see the pictures of it, you see everything on it. There's so much disinformation that's out there, they don't feel like they can believe anything. I don't believe the news, but I believe God. I believe the Word of God. I believe every word that's in there, and I believe that is His truth. And I thank God for people that will tell us the truth. The king tells Jeremiah in verse 16, he says, As the Lord liveth that made our soul, he said, made this soul. He said, I'm not going to put you to death, neither am I going to give you the people that's going to put you to death. So Zedekiah, again, knew that there was God, and he knew he had a soul, and he knew who made that soul. And again, I believe he really wanted to do the right thing, but it was too hard for him. I believe it was too hard for him to do the right thing. So Jeremiah begins to tell him what God said. He said, he said but you got to go back to the words that was originally said in all of this before we get to that part. Jeremiah says, he said, now if I tell you what God has told me, you're going to kill me. And you're not going to obey the words that I, you're not going to listen to the counsel that I give you. And the king replied, I will not put you to death. I'm not going to put you to death. I'm not going to deliver you to people that want to kill you. And he was committed to saving the life of Jeremiah. That was easy. But he never committed to saying, I'll listen to the counsel of the Lord. He committed, said, Jeremiah, I'm, uh, you asked me two questions. You said, you said that I'll kill you and I won't listen to it. I won't kill you. I'll do the easy thing. I won't kill you because that'll make me feel guilty. But I'm not going to obey the Lord. He didn't say it, but the fact that he didn't say it was that he did say it. I'm, I, don't, I can't obey the Lord. I, can't, I cannot commit to obeying what you're going to tell me, what God says. I can't, commit, I can't make that commitment because I don't know if I have it in me. I don't want to get to that point in my life where I say, I can't commit to what God says because I don't know if I've got the stuff inside of me to be committed to God. I don't know if I can be 100% committed that no matter what happens that I am going to stay true to God. He never committed to obeying God, and he never committed to putting that advice into action. I'll do the easy part, but I can't do that hard part. Again, he believed in God, and he wanted to save Jeremiah, but he wasn't ready to make that commitment. To obedience. And so Jeremiah said in 17, he said, Go with the kings, go with the prince of the Babylon princes. He said, Then your soul will live and the city will not be burned. He said, You will live and your house will live. Verse 18, he said, But if you won't go, he said, This city is not going to make it. If you don't go, this city's not going to make it. They're going to burn it, and you're not going to escape out of their hands. Here's how it is, king. Here, here, here's how it is to live, king. He said, here's where the blessings of the Lord. Give in to the will of God, and you're going to be blessed. Give in to the will of God. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it is, no matter how odd it is, give in to the enemy, go, let them take you captive. Give in to the will of God, no matter what it is, and you'll be blessed. But if you fight against it, lay your pride down, lay your desires down, lay your fears down, and you're going to live. God will provide. Your city, your family, the people are going to live. But then the king reveals his fear in verse 19. He said, but I'm afraid. He was afraid. He was afraid of the people. He said, I'm afraid. He said, I'm afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans lest they deliver me into their hand. And they mock me. He was afraid of being made fun of. He was afraid of being mocked. He was afraid of making, make, them making him look like he was weak. It's the same issues that we have sometimes in our life. I, I'm, a, I'm afraid to live for God. I'm afraid to make a stand for God. I'm afraid to stand up for what's right. I, yeah, they may tell dirty jokes. I'm afraid to, to walk away from them. I'm afraid to look like I'm better than them. It's not that better now. I, I've got a God. I've got a God that's holy. I've got a God that's holy, and I can't allow junk to come in my head. I, can't, I don't want to allow that stuff in there. I don't want to affect in the way I think. If you're, worried, if you're living your life worrying about people and what they think, again, you're not going to live life. <laughs> you're not going to live life if you're sitting there worried about how people... You're not, but if you worry about what God thinks about you, if you worry about how God feels about you, you'll find real life. Then you'll find peace, you'll find freedom, you'll find victory, you'll find direction 
for your life. And Jeremiah begins to plead with the king. He says in verse 38, verse, uh, chapter 38, verse 20, he said, uh, chapter 20, he said, but Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver thee. He said, obey. I, I beg of you, king, obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto you, so shall it be well with unto thee, and thy soul will live. You will remain alive, king, if you'll just simply obey. Everything will work out, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how flipped upside down. Everything may seem, like Jonathan said, everything feel like it was going on. But if you just stick the course, if you stay on the right train, if you stay on the right path, everything will work out. God, your soul will live. I beg of you, king, obey the Lord and you will live. But if you refuse, he said. Here's what the Lord showed me, and I, don't, I won't bring up the scripture. He said, but the women that are in your house are going to be taken to the king of Babylon's house. And they're going to say, your friends prevailed in making you listen to them. Where are they at now? He said, they're going to take your wives, and they're going to take your kids, and you're not going to escape out of their hands, king. And the, city's going to be, the city is going to be burned, and it's going to be your fault. It's all going to be your fault. Here's what happens when you will not obey the word of the Lord when God has given you the word. The pastor said last week, it's easier for the sinner to say, it's easier for a sinner to live out there than it is for someone that's heard the word. It's easier for the sinner to go out there and live their life than it is for us for somebody that's heard the word that knows the word because we've got some responsibility now. God has showed us the truth. God has showed us the word. We know what the we know about the mercies. Jonathan told about what the mercies of God are like. That He'll forgive even somebody that's mutilated their grandmother. That somebody that God will actually forgive. We know about the mercies of God. I I know about the holiness of God because we sing it up here. I know about what God can do. I know, I know. The king wanted to know what happens, and he found out. He found out what happens when you obey, and he found out what happens when you don't obey. There is a reward with obedience, but there is a price to be paid when you don't obey. There is a price to pay, be paid for disobedience. The king told Jeremiah, don't tell anybody that you've talked to me, and you're not going to die. Again, he was committed to saving Jeremiah's life. But he never said, I want to do what God wants. Jeremiah, just tell me what God wants and I'll do it. It was never that. It was never that commitment to obeying God. He couldn't commit to that. And finally, when the Chaldeans finally came in, the pastor alluded to it just a little bit last week, he and all the men of war and all his family ran away instead of giving in to the will of God. Allowing God's will to be done, he ran from it. Or rather, rather than running to the altar and say, God, whatever it is I'm going to do, when they came, he ran away. And the king and his party was followed, and they was overtaken by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, and judgment was pronounced on him. And this is one of the saddest stories in the whole Bible. When I read this, I want to tear up. When I read about it, they took the king, they bound him up in chains, and they took him up to Nebuchadnezzar. And they set his sons in front of him, and they killed him right there in front of him. They killed his sons knowing that the buck stops with you, buddy. You're the last one of your generation. There ain't nobody else. And then right after that, they plucked his eyes out. So that the last thing that he saw was the fruits of his disobedience. That's one of the saddest things in the whole Bible. I, I can't imagine that you're thinking, God, if I'd have just listened to the man of God. God, if I'd have just remained faithful to the church. God, if I would have just been faithful to the house. God, if I would have just, if I'd have just listened, if I would have just heard the preaching, if I would have just repented, all of my family, my children now are gone. My, all of this stuff is happening to my family. The walls are tore down now in the cities. The king's house is burnt. All the houses, other houses are burnt. And they tear the walls down because of one man. Because of one man's disobedience. King, obey and you'll live. Not only will you live, but your family will live. The city will live and it will not be burnt. But disobey. One of the saddest stories. Hey, and then they took him, put him back in, in, in the chain, or he's still in the chains, and then they carried him off to Babylon. They carried him off, and he's got to walk through that city, smelling all those smells, hearing all those sounds. And I can't imagine the thoughts that's going through his head. God, I wish I would listen to Jeremiah. God, I, listen, I wish I'd have listened to Pastor Clark. God, I wish I'd have been faithful to the house of God. Now look at my family. My kids are gone. Lord, if I had just listened. God, if I would have just listened. If I would have just obeyed, God, if I could have just committed to it, God. 
God, if we would, God, obey, church. Obey this morning. Obey, I beg. Just like Jeremiah, obey, and you will live. But if you disobey, there's a price to be paid for it. Lord Jesus, God, I praise you. Help us, God. Help me, Lord Jesus, God. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help me, Lord Jesus. Where was Jeremiah and all of this? He was still in prison. But Nebuchadnezzar came and said, he gave charges to the princes. He said, guys, I want you all to go find Nebuchadnezzar, and I don't want you to touch him. I don't want you to do no harm to him. As a matter of fact, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. The princes of his own people wanted him dead, but here comes Nebuchadnezzar's princes because Nebuchadnezzar knew he was sent from God. He knew, he knew, Nebuchadnezzar knew he was a servant of the Lord. He was carrying out the judgment of God. And the princes of the, uh, Babylon had more respect for him. They carry him out, they take him, and he gets to go home and spend time at home. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah talking about Adrian's cousin again, the Ethiopian eunuch. And he said, because he intervened in, in, in saving your life, he said, you're not going to be delivered into the hands of those that you fear. He said, I'm going to deliver you while everybody else is being carried around and you're worried about your family. He said, I'm not going to deliver you to them. I'm going to allow you to be free. I'm going to allow you to stay in the city while everybody's else. You know why? Because you obeyed the Lord. Because you feared the Lord. Because you were committed. Because you committed, unit. Because you committed to the Lord. While everything else around you is falling apart, I'm going to be there to protect you. I'm going to be there to keep you. I'm going to be the guy, there to guide you. Even if you're afraid of them taking you, God says, I'm not going to let them take you. I'm not going to let them take you. I thank God so much because he is our way of escape this morning. He is the way of escape. It may have been hard, but there was a reward for Jeremiah and, the, and Eunuch. The Lord purposely gave a command to the king and them and told them, he said, I want, you to, I want you to go with those people. I want you to go with the Babylonians. I don't want you to resist. And to us, really, that kind of doesn't make sense, does it, Brother Clarence? Somebody's coming into the church, the, you know, the, the Russians are coming, and I want you to go. I don't want you to fight. I want you just to give in and go with them. Lord, why in the world would you want, why, you'd want us to fight for our liberty? You'd want us to put up. And God said, no, I don't want you to. We know, that we know the reason for it. We know that it was a punishment for past sin. But they wouldn't commit to God and then following God in the good times. And God says, okay, if you're not going to commit to me following me in the good times, maybe if I oppress you, maybe then you'll turn your life to me. How many people have we seen that God, they wouldn't commit to God in following God in the blessings and all the things that God has given, and then all of a sudden everything begins to turn down and it's that spiral downhill, and there's, God says, maybe if I oppress you, maybe if I come against you, maybe if I bring the world against you, maybe you'll turn around and you'll remember me. Maybe before you hit rock bottom, before you go underneath the rock that's at the bottom, maybe you'll catch a glimpse of actually who I am. The king, the, God's blessing is trusting in the Lord. Trusting that God is working all things, as Brother Jonathan said. God is working all things to the good for those that love God, to those that are called according to God's purpose. That's us. We are called. We are the called according to God's purpose. We are. God. All things works to the good for me, no matter how bad. Brother Clarence, it was an accident. I don't know why you, you was in that accident. I don't, but I'm just going to trust God that whatever it is, whatever it is, all things are working to the good. I, I, Mom's gone out of here. I don't know why she's gone, but I know all things work to the good. I get to crying sometimes and I'm thinking about her, and I say, God, forgive me for being weak. Forgive me for crying. I should be rejoicing that she's gone. I still cry. I, still, I got sad this morning. I was crying in the bed thinking about her, but I still got to rejoice that she's finished the race. She's finished her course. She's made it all the way to the end. I'm the one that's got some ways to go. She obeyed and there was a reward for that obedience. But when we refuse to commit to following God, when we refuse to commit to Him, obeying God is in my best interests. Obeying God is in your best interests. Obeying God is in the best interests of your family. You can be a blessing to your family by you obeying God. If the king would have obeyed God, the whole nation would have 
benefited from it. But because he was chosen, God, he was chosen. Yeah, maybe he wasn't the right living king, but God set him in a place because he had a heart to know God because he kept going to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, give me, go pray for us. Jeremiah, give me a word. Give me something. And he had a heart to do what was right. He just couldn't do it because it was just too hard. <laughs> it was just too hard. Jesus came down. A man, a man came down, gave his life for the sins of all men and women. To make a difference. How can one man make a difference? How can one man make a difference? He didn't. Father, let this cup pass from me, but, but nevertheless, not my will. But thine be done. He showed us what obedience was all about. He didn't want the flesh of Jesus that was God in the flesh. He didn't want to go through what he wanted to go through. He says, it's too hard. I don't want to. But nevertheless. Not my will, Lord, but thine, because he was committed to being obedient, because it wasn't just about him. It was about everybody else. Me being, I should commit to God, not just because it's just about me, but because of her and Heather and Nick and everybody here in the church. If I wasn't committed to be unobeying God, I wouldn't be up here. You'd have to find another guitar player. You'd have to find a pastor. You'd have to find somebody else to be up here pre preaching for him, because it's not about me. Because of his obedience, because of Jesus' obedience, I don't, the pastor said it last week again, I keep going back to that. He's talking about we don't have to get up and worry about finding an animal in the mornings and making sure it's all spotless and we get up here and there's blood all over the place. Because of that, if there's not this big, huge, long list of do's and don'ts that we have to follow and we have to keep up with. Righteousness doesn't come from that, but righteousness comes from his obedience. Romans 5 and 19 says, For as by one man's obedience... Many were made right, made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5 and 19, if y'all want to put that up there. Jesus showed us what being committed. And it'll not just bless you, but it blesses others as well. If righteousness could come from the obedience of one person, if obedience could do that much for just one person, what would happen if, a couple did it. A husband and wife was obedient. What would happen if several of us in the church were obedient? What would have happened if a, a lot of us in the church were obedient? What would happen? What would God do if all of us were obedient to the Word of God in our lives? Too often we cherry pick the rules, not the rules, we cherry pick the the commandments of God, the things that we want, we want to follow this one, we want to follow that one, but we don't really want, we're not really committed to 100%. Oh, I'm committed, not just 100%, 99. No, 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 because there's a, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave, I don't want to even leave a pinhole. I don't want a pinhole in my shield of faith. I don't want a pinhole in my shield of faith because if the devil can get a dart somewhere or another, I don't want to leave a pinhole. I don't want 99.9% .9 of a shield of faith. I want 100%. I don't want 99 and 99.5% of the sword of the, of the word of God. I want every bit of it because I need it for my protection. We want what suits our liking. Pick and choose. I remember cherry picking down uh, at Clear Fork with Dad, and we went with the pastor sometimes. We went down there several times, and, and we'd pick cherries, and we always got the, Jonathan said it this morning, the low-hanging fruit. We'd go for that low-hanging fruit that was really easy to get to. But more times than not, the biggest bunches and the best bunches were in those hard-to-get places where you had to put the ladder in that odd place, and you had to twist, and you had to contort, and you had to twist your body to get up. Now, we ate more than we picked most of the time. We were generally sick by the time we got there, but it's hard not to eat a bunch of black heart cherries when you're picking them, okay? There was many seeds laying down at the bottom of, of, of the tree. But we would have to twist and contort 
put our place ourselves in a hard place when we're picking apples there at Mama's on those trees. The, some the, there's good apples there on the bottom, but the best apples. I got me an apple picker. I got me one of those big old poles with a basket on there. You can just reach up there and get. Because I was over there at Mama's up against the house, and right there at the chimney one year there was apples that were that big. And I, they were above the chimney, and I couldn't get to them. And I was like, I'm bound and determined to get them next year. <laughs> I am bound and determined because that's the best looking thing. Those were the best looking fruits. The ones on the bottom, they were okay. They were, but the ones that was up at the top, and I couldn't get them. I had to go and do something. I had to spend some money, but. Normally, I get up in the ladder, and I'm climbing, and I'm twisting, and I'm putting myself in odd positions and putting my place itself because the reward was at the top. The reward came with doing, doing the hard stuff. The reward came with putting myself in a position that I wasn't quite comfortable with that, that, that made me a little bit nervous, but I, I, I wanted to reach up there. There's a reward for doing hard things in life. There is a reward. Our, our world is not teaching our kids to do hard things. There is a reward with doing hard things. Like It teaches grit. It teaches being tough. It teaches that hard work accomplishes things. And our world doesn't teach that anymore. We need a, our kids need a little bit of grit in their life. But there's a reward with doing hard things for God. There's a reward with doing the hard things in God. Jeremiah thrown in the, in the prison, still giving out the word of God. Jeremiah stuck down in the muck and the mire, left there to starve to death, still giving out the word of God. But the reward for his obedience was that God was never going to plan it on leaving him in that prison. God had a plan of escape for him. God had an escape plan for his life. And there is a reward for doing the hard things. If we've decided we're going to just do the hard things, what happens if we would just decide? What if we just decided we're going to obey God, that we're all going to get together? We're, some of us, one or two, a couple, again, a husband, a wife, is going to, we're going to decide we're going to obey God. We're, we're going to find out what it does. I'm going to do, I've decided I'm going to do something hard in my life. I'm going to do something. To, I, I worked over at Brandon's house. Back a couple of months ago. I ain't never told him. I saw a pad that he had on his, beside his computer. He had a list of things on there that he wanted to accomplish. I don't, can't remember. A millionaire. Don't you have a millionaire, Tom, John, uh, Tom Brandon? Wanted to be a millionaire. Wanted to be a philanthropist. That's a person that helps people because they got lots of money. It wasn't about him. It's because he wanted to help some us. Doing hard things accomplishes things, people. Setting goals of God, I, I don't know what, but you know what, God? I, me and my wife, we're going, me and Brenda, are going, we're going to sit down. We're going to do some hard things. I, I've done preaching myself on this one. We're going to sit down. We're going to do some hard things. We're going to find out what, God, what happens if we get a little bit closer to you, God? What happens if we decide to do some really hard things, God? That when we, we, what happens when we take this stuff a little bit more serious than what we really do? I'm not saying I'm not serious about God. But what I'm saying is I'm not all that serious about some of the commands or even the suggestions that God has. Luke 18 and 1, Jesus gave us a parable, and it was for a reason. It says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, for this purpose, for this reason, that men ought always to pray and not faint. In other words, he gave us a parable that says, guys, y'all ought to be always praying and not fainting. The whole reason. And it was the story about the unjust judge. And the woman brought her request to him over and over, and he wouldn't listen. But she would keep on persisting. She would keep on nagging and nagging and nagging until he said, i got to get her off my back. In other words, God's saying, if you'll keep on nagging me, if you'll keep bringing, even though it may seem hard, i got to pray the same prayer over and over, and I may have to pray more than just five or six minutes. I may have to get down to business for 30 minutes or for an hour. But if we just keep on nagging God, if we just keep on God, if we just keep God, you got, not, just, not just a... If we decide I'm going to pray until I get an answer, I'm going to pray until I feel God move.
We don't just pray, oh, Lord, touch Zach Carter. Oh, Lord, just touch Brother Jay. Oh, Lord, just touch Brother Randy. Oh, Lord, touch Albert Nunn. Or touch our children. Or God, touch our grandchildren. We get like Hannah, and we get down at the altar, and we cry, and we pray until the man of God says, there's something, they must be drunk. No, it's the Spirit of God. I've got serious with God. Hannah wanted a baby so bad that she got down on the altar and she cried and she prayed to the man of God. She had no voice and the man of God thought she was drunk, but it wasn't because she had something she wanted from God. And she said, I'm going to keep on knocking. I'm going to keep on beating on the doors of heaven until God gives me an answer. What if we came down here one night and said, God, I don't know why you ain't healed, Brother Jay, but God, we're going to be here until we get an answer. I'm going to find out tonight, God. We're going to be here for an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it takes. There is a reward in doing hard things. There is a reward with obeying God. What if we decided when Jesus said some things come only by fasting prayer? We actually got serious about that. We don't just fast, oh, God, I'll fast TV today. Oh, God, I'll fast Internet. Oh, God, I'll fast a meal. Oh, God, I'll say a prayer and I'll fast a half of a meal if I can. What if we got down to business and say, God, I'll fast today. I'll fast two days. I'll fast three days. Whatever it takes, God, until I get an answer. I'll pray until I know that God moves. I'm going to reach that apple at the, the top of the tree. I may have to twist and contort my body. I may have to put myself in a dangerous situation. I may have to do, I may have to stress and strain. But whatever it is, God, I plan on doing it because I believe in doing some hard, obeying God and doing some hard things, trusting in him. We may have to take one prayer request and fast a week and pray hours for it. But whatever it is, if it was serious, Sister Jewel, how serious? Sister Jewel's life, she's over in the hospital. What if we had to get down and pray the rest of the day? God, touch Sister Jewel. Lord, bring her out. God, whatever it is, Lord, I want you to move. I know we pray, and I know we trust God, but the... Jesus said, I give you this parable to this end. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't faint until you get you an answer from God. There are some things that are worth that. I trust the Lord for Sister Jewel. I trust in him now. But there are some things that are worth just that kind of a prayer. There are my kids, my girl, well, I ain't got grandkids yet. I don't want to go there, Lord, yet. Hold on. I almost said my grandkids. I don't want to be a prophet quite yet. Whew. Pull the reins back on that one. But there are some prayer requests that are worth that. There are some things that's worth an hour of prayer. Charlene called me the other day. And she was talking about Bryce, and she called me because Bryce is crying and praying he can't go to sleep. He can't, you know, and I said, well, we'll pray. We'll, you know, the, the, the old can dancer, we'll pray, we'll pray. Okay. And then I said, no, we're going to pray right now. And we began to pray over the phone. We began to pray, and I felt the Spirit of the Lord begin to move. And it wasn't long after that, she sends me a picture of him falling asleep on the couch. And I thank God. I had to thank God. God, thank you, Lord, for being answering prayers still, God. It wasn't a long prayer. It don't have to be a long prayer. But you pray until you feel something from God. Oh, Lord, just, I wasn't satisfied with just, look. I prayed the rest of the day. Every time I thought about him, God touched Bryce, God touched Bryce, God touched Bryce. I'm closing, I'm closing, I'm serious, I'm promised, I'm closing right now, y'all come up. Committed to obedience, it can be a hard thing. It can be a tough, it, we may worry about people mocking us, we may worry about people making fun of us. But there's blessings that come with being committed to obeying God completely, to being faithful to his word, to being faithful to his commands, his guidance, his suggestions. The king, all he had to do was just, all he had to do was go with the invading army and everything was going to be fine. But because he didn't, his, chi his children lost their lives. He lost his eyes. The city was burned. The walls were torn down. Everybody's house was burned. Jeremiah pleaded with him, obey, king, obey, and live.
And that's all it took. But his desires of his flesh, the desires of his heart, he couldn't overcome that because it was just, it was just too hard. And because of all that, he feared the people, he feared about what they were going to do. And he had to pay the price. And he was on his own when he got caught by the king of Babylon. And that's what happens when we choose to do what we want to do versus doing what God wants to do. We're on our own. And I don't want to be caught on my own when the enemy comes knocking on my door. Jonathan said it while he was, while he was talking. He was talking about David and how David sent off the, the Ark of the Covenant. He was separating himself from the presence of God. When you go off on your own, you are separating yourself from the presence of God. Because God says, obedience is this path. And you said, I'm going to go take a peek over in this direction. I just want to see. I don't want to go quite over this way. I'll go instead of this direction, I'll go that direction. It's kind of close. I'm close to it. But that path will eventually leads where God's not. And I don't want to be on my own when the enemy comes knocking. I, I, I don't want to be on my own when the troubles start coming down. When, when everything starts going on, I, I, I don't want to be on my I want Jesus in my boat. I want Jesus right there. beside. I want the master of the winds. I want the master of the seas. I want the master of the waves in the boat next to me. It's not easy. It's, it, it takes hard. It's not easy to admit that. I'm not exactly where I need to be. I'll tell you, Dwayne tells you right now, I'm not exactly where I need to be today. I'm not exactly where I need to, where I could be. I could be a whole lot closer to God. And I want to, but I'm not going to do it until I get totally committed to God. And following his will and following his leading, no matter what, no matter what it's like. Today, right here's an altar. Right there's an altar, and this is the greatest place in the world that you can start saying, God, I'm going to start obeying. But it's not hard to come up here. It's hard to come up here and make that in minutes. I know a lot of us like to pray at our seats, but sometimes it takes doing some hard things. It takes shaking it up, shaking up the basket sometimes, shaking the, shaking the tree, doing whatever it takes. But there is a reward in it. I promise you there is a reward. God will reward you if you'll be faithful to him, if you'll be faith, committed to obedience. Won't you come, Pastor?